Thank you for that introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Wow. I Thanks, Julie. I haven't felt this good before I talk. <laughs> I wish I knew this before you know, all the exams that I drive to and pump up live music and try to pump myself up. I could have just done this and I might have felt a lot better. But, um, Am I going the wrong way? Oh, I'm so fine. Because you are, unless you want to do some more exercise. <laughs> that was my bad. So I'll spend the next 45 minutes making a crank up again. Let's <laughs> <laughs> it again. Um, so I, I, I was asked to speak on uh, a primer on cardiac testing, which meant I could speak about just about anything, or a little bit about nothing. Um, but so in the end, I just thought, We'll discuss stress testing and kind of go into it in detail. We all utilize it, and I think it might provide us a good opportunity to um, revisit things and also uh, for me to answer any questions anyone might have. So I have no conflict of interest, and the idea of this talk is to relate some of the physiology, uh, discuss you know some of the uh, nuances about ordering stress tests to talk a little bit about the various stress testing modalities and to look at some of the guideline recommendations regarding stress testing. And there are a lot of these, and I just tried to summarize what I thought were some of the salient uh, features. So stress tests can be used for both diagnosis and prognosis. And um, exercise stress testing is probably the best modality that we can utilize because it provides us a wealth of information. We use it for detecting the presence of significant coronary artery disease, but in addition to that, as you know, if someone has known lesions uh, on previous cardiac cath, for example, if they have not had an FFR on the table, uh, which is fractional flow reserve, uh, then you can bring them back, have them do a stress test, and um, you can grade the severity of coronary artery disease for further decision making. It can, you can check the effectiveness of previous medical interventions using stress testing, uh, you can predict uh, cardiovascular events and all-cause mortality, and I have a couple of slides on that. You can look at a person's physical uh, capacity, effort tolerance, um, what they if they describe exercise-related symptoms. Uh, exercise testing gives you a lot of information about that. And finally, it can also uh, let you um, figure out if an arrhythmia gets worse with exercise or better with exercise, and how they, patients respond to an arrhythmia, whether it's a brady arrhythmia or a tachy arrhythmia. Finally, it's also utilized to give an exercise prescription, say if someone's 55 years old and all of a sudden decides they've never exercised in their life but want to start an exercise program, perhaps they want to get tested, it's appropriate to uh, do a stress test to get an exercise prescription. So when most of the time when we order stress tests, it's uh, primarily to detect CAD and uh, severity of coronary artery disease. And so the process is is a stepwise process. The first thing we have to do is determine the pretest probability. This is very important. Um, and then you evaluate the patient at rest. And to evaluate them, there are various modalities you can use, starting with ECG and, and moving on. And then you stress them, and then you evaluate them after stress using the same modality and look for the difference. And you interpret the test, you determine the post-test probability, and then you plan further management. This is the process we go through for not just stress tests, but pretty much every test that we perform. As far as stressing our patients is concerned, we can exercise them, and we can use pharmacologic agents like dobutamine, adenosine, prostatine, and Lexiscan, or regadenosine. As far as how we detect problems during stress testing, you can use the ECG. You can use an echo, which can be added on top of an ECG to provide additional information. You can use SPECT, which is our usual nuclear perfusion studies. There's also PET scanning, which is, gives you much better pictures than SPECT, but it's expensive, so we don't utilize it in all centers. And MRI is also available to do stress testing as an imaging modality. It's important to understand that ischemia cascade. So when we have significant coronary disease and we start going through stress that starts to place demands on us, the first thing that starts to happen is myocardial supply-demand mismatch. 
Then you start getting subtle perfusion abnormalities that can be detected on a spec, for example. That's why they're very sensitive. Subsequent to that, you start to get metabolic abnormalities within myocardial tissue. Then you start to develop some diastolic dysfunction, some stiffening of the heart. And as this ischemia progresses, you start to develop systolic dysfunction, which is regional wall motion abnormalities that can be detected on echo. And then you start to develop ECG abnormalities, and ultimately the patient starts to develop chest pain. So this cascade represents a series of testing opportunities that can detect subclinical ischemia, for example, if they don't have angina. But the majority of patients, we take them until they develop chest pain, and we can see the development of this cascade depending on the modalities that we use. When we test people with exercise, uh, there are different kinds of exercise activity that we can describe. And so there's dynamic exercise, where which is isotonic and basically involves uh, stre uh, stretching and shortening of the muscle fibers. And then you have static exercise, which is more of a, uh, a standard uh, length of your muscle fibers during the exercise process. We use dynamic testing during our exercise. And muscles undergo metabolic activity, and as you know, this can be aerobic, and once you go beyond the aerobic threshold, you start to have anaerobic metabolism. Now remember, better trained people do better on stress tests. So better trained people have higher thresholds, and you may need to take them a little further beyond just the standard heart rate, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, for dynamic stress testing, we use the treadmill, and that's pretty much our standard across our system and the majority of systems across the United States. Other options are bicycle and arm ergometry, which is basically an arm bicycle. And But arm ergometry is primarily for people who cannot walk, and that's going to replace essentially the part of life of stress testing. There are various cardiovascular responses to exercise. So what happens? So our stroke volume is that it starts to go up. You start to pump out more and more until it reaches a plateau at about 50 to 60 percent of our peak oxygen, uh, peak uh, VO2 max, which is our peak oxygen, uh, aerobic, peak aerobic metabolism. Um, the heart rate response is that it starts to go up and up and up. And generally for mo most people, it hits a peak. That peak is different for different individuals. It's a very simple formula. Uh, 220 minus age, which predicts our peak predicted heart rate, but as you might imagine, just age is not a very good predictor of everyone's abilities, everyone's physiology, so it's not a perfect tool, but that's what we utilize for te stress testing, 220 minus age is peak, and when we talk about 85% of peak, it's 85% of this number that we get when we subtract age from 220. There is variability among individuals, which is why the recommendation is always to do a symptom-limited stress test as opposed to a heart rate-limited stress test. So you don't just stop them as soon as they reach 85%, because it doesn't give you all the prognostic information you really can take away from a stress test. So that's the heart rate response to stress testing. Then you to exercise. Then you have the arteriovenous uptake, so we extract more oxygen from our blood as our demands increase. And there's a physiologic limit to this. And finally, uh, our blood pressure response to exercise is that our systolic blood pressure normally goes up, goes up pretty substantially in, some, in many people, and, and that's a normal response. It can go up to 200 uh, millimeters of mercury. And your diastolic generally tends to drop. As far as the myocardial oxygen uptake is concerned, there are three things that determine what demand the heart itself places. So if you have increased contractility, myocardial demand goes up. If you have increased heart rate, myocardial demand goes up. And finally, there's a, a concept known as intramyocardial wall stress. And this is also a very important determinant of um, myocardial oxygen uptake. But we can estimate um, our myocardial oxygen uptake by something called a double product, which is just the heart rate times the blood pressure. And the percentile range 10 to 90 is 25,000 to 40,000. We don't usually report this because we have enough prognostic information from the rest of the test, but that's, you know, uh, theoretically, that's one of the uh, things that you can obtain from a stress test. So what happens to your coronary blood flow during a stress test? So there's a linear correlation with between myocardial oxygen uptake and 
blood flow. So as your demands increase, that blood flow starts to increase, and it can go up to five times the baseline level when uh, you uh, undergo exercise. But if you have a location with obstruction, partial obstruction, what happens is that region is not able to increase its coronary blood flow as much. So you get regional mismatch, you get regional flow differences. And this heterogeneity is what we utilize in stress testing, particularly with imaging stress testing, because that really comes out. In exercise stress testing, you really can't localize where something's going on. But in imaging stress testing, you can localize better and we utilize this flow heterogeneity in part. Um, it detects this flow heterogeneity. The other interesting thing is you can get people to walk on a standard cruise protocol, uh, which goes, you know, three minutes each stage. Uh, people may be able to walk the same time, but if their heart rate doesn't go up as much and their blood pressure doesn't go up as much, they can go a bit longer. So your, your rate pressure product actually determines the, your ischemia threshold better than just simply exercise stage. And that just reflects the fact that your rate pressure product correlates with your myocardial oxygen uptake. And the corollary of that is if you train yourself well, you can push that um, exercise time a little further before you reach your angional threshold. Functional capacity, there's, there's a lot of useful information about prognosis that exercise can give us. Exercise stress testing lets us know about functional capacity, which is probably the most important marker of prognosis from a cardiovascular standpoint. Uh, whether it's perioperative testing or even um, applying for surgical procedures and, and determining whether they're fit from a cardiovascular standpoint. Um, and we all know about metabolic equivalence and how it's equal to the, the metabolic rate of a resting person seated quietly and how there are multiples of that where, um, you know, the average resting kind of walk around the house doing simple activities is up to four minutes and then beyond that as we start to do more activities, start playing tennis, et cetera, and you start to increase your metabolic activity to 8 to 11, et cetera. Um, but there are other things that we can glean from an exercise stress test. For example, someone has someone is bradycardic and they say they're short of breath and you know you don't really know what to do, and then you put them on a treadmill and their heart rate stays at 60 the entire time, it goes up to 65 or 70. That means that they're not able to increase their heart rate appropriately in the exercise and um, they have chronotropic incompetence and they may require a pacemaker. So a stress test can help us recover that. Another marker of prognosis is actually heart rate recovery. So how fast your heart rate recovers once you stop exercise. They don't usually report this, but it has been correlated to uh, prognosis. The Duke treadmill score has been shown um, to correlate both with cardiac mortality and with all-cause mortality. So if, and basically, you look at how much ST depression there is. Well, how much, how long the patient goes on your standard Bruce protocol, how much ST depression there is, and how much angina they have. And you use a scoring system, and you come up with a number. And if it's, you know, it, it can be if it's greater than five, then that's a, um, a good thing. If it's less than minus eleven, that's a bad thing. So you can use it to prognosticate. You can get tables. And if you have a patient who's very proactive about this health and they have a stress test and you want to give them hard and fast prognostic information, this is a great way to discuss with them what their prognostic information is. And tables are available, you'll be able to find it. And it provides you another way to look at things in addition to your ASCP risk calculator, which um, we'll go through also. So the Duke Treadmill Score is a useful scoring system. There are different exercise protocols we can utilize. There's the Bruce protocol, which we, is, the, is the standard one we use on the majority of people. But a lot of people, uh, older people especially, cannot achieve exercise. So we have a modified Bruce protocol, which kind of starts off a little slower um, without a grade, and, and then it just kind of builds up a little slower. So it gives people a bit more time to achieve their target heart rate, a bit more time of exercise, because if you don't exercise, for long enough during a stress test, if you exercise for less than three minutes, you really haven't reached the equilibrium you need to reach to be able to make a good decision about whether you have ischemia or not. You need to reach a good equilibrium before you can do that. Another uh, protocol we might use is called the Norton protocol, which uses two-minute stages in gradual steps. 
Let's talk a little bit about who we should not perform stress tests on. So people with high risk unstable angina who come into the hospital who you think has angina, even though the troponins are negative, you think they definitely have angina. They probably shouldn't be getting stress tests. Although patients with chest pain syndromes who come in who are otherwise uh, who are otherwise stable, they're pain free, they can undergo exercise stress testing if you don't deem them to be at high risk. People with decompensated CHF or uncontrolled heart failure should not get exercise testing. People with uncontrolled hypertension greater than 200 over 110 at baseline, you shouldn't do stress testing because when you stress them, as you know, your systolic is going to go up and it can get to uncontrolled levels, which can be a problem during stress testing and lead to false positive stress tests. Uncontrolled cardiac bradyarrhythmias, if they have very slow heart rates, you might utilize a stress test, but if they have very hot, rapid heart rates at baseline, you might want to consider whether you want to do the stress test or not, particularly in SPT, for example, you want to cancel the stress test, stabilize them, and then do a stress test at a later time. Other conditions, a patient with an acute PE shouldn't be getting an exercise stress test. Someone with symptomatic severe aortic stenosis should not get a stress test. Now, with asymptomatic aortic stenosis, it's becoming increasingly necessary to perform stress testing as part of their um, as part of their evaluation. So these are not patients with critical aortic stenosis where the valve area is like 0. 0.6. We're talking about patients with a valve area around one, between one and 0.8, who you know they say I feel great, and maybe they're not really revealing or they're not aware of their symptoms. The stress test under supervision with, re uh, with referrals to a cardiologist and under their supervision is being increasingly performed. But people with myocarditis, pericarditis, aortic dissection, severe pulmonary hypertension, and acute MI, and someone acutely ill for any reason, they really shouldn't undergo an exercise stress test because you're not giving accurate prognostic information. And you're, you might be overestimating their mortality rate, for example, by simply putting them on a stress test, and they may not achieve the exercise capacity that they're actually capable of achieving in a normal healthy state. Um, people with left main coronary artery disease uh, is a relative co uh, contraindication um, depending on the severity of the coronary artery disease. Um, again, we spoke about aortic stenosis, and similarly, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we find that increasingly we're determining symptoms using hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we um, do things in a controlled fashion and under supervision, and it is appropriate these days to obtain a stress test for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in <coughs> controlled settings with a referral. We spoke about tachy and brady arrhythmias, and um, we spoke about risk stratification. People with high degree AV block, you need to be careful because they can deteriorate during a stress test. They can go from set a two to one block to a complete high block if they have a block in lower down in the conduction system. People with electrolyte abnormalities can develop weird arrhythmias, and people with mental or physical impairment that restricts them from exercising also can run into trouble during stress testing. When do you stop a stress test? We stop a stress test when we see ST elevation. That indicates myocardial injury. It's time to stop the stress test. Um, people with you know, pre-existing ST elevations, like um, early repolarization, for example, frequently the ST segments actually start to go down during stress testing. So if you see ST elevation, and your kind of typical ST elevation, especially if occurring during stress testing, we need to stop the test. If they have arrhythmias that prevent us from making a diagnosis or that indicate a potentially dangerous situation, like if they have very rapid uh, SVT or if they have uh, VT developing, we stop the test. If they develop a uh, left final branch block and we cannot tell if they have ST elevations or not, even if they're asymptomatic, we may choose to just stop that stress test because we cannot tell if they're really developing ischemia or not. And if we push them, they might it might represent an, a myocardial injury. Um, Finally, there's excessive ST depression. So you have four to five millimeters of ST depression. You've got chest pain. We just we have the information to stop the stress test. These are some of the reasons. But in addition to that, if someone has symptoms of angina that are pretty severe, we stop the stress test. If they're markedly fatigued or dyspneic, we stop the stress test. If they start to get dizzy and feel like they're going to fall off a treadmill, we stop the stress test. 
the size of cold computers, so they look like that clammy, cold, so a little cyanotic, pale, we stop the stress test. A drop in blood pressure is important. We expect everyone's blood pressure to go up. Some people stay kind of flat, but if you drop your blood pressure, and they're symptomatic especially, and they have any signs of cold perfusion, we stop the stress test. 10 millimeters or more from baseline, we stop the stress test. Sometimes it's due to measurement error, because people are walking and they're trying to check the blood pressure. It may not, we may not pick it up accurately, so they feel fantastic, look fantastic, we might say, to check it again. But in other instances, if the clinical situation fits and there's a blood pressure drop, we stop the stress test. If there's an excessively hypertensive response to exercise, we stop the stress test. 250 systolic, but in actual practice, if it goes to 230, we're starting to get concerned. And we start to see false positive ECG changes if it's just an exercise test. So we generally tend to stop the blood test. I'm sorry, the stress test. If we have technical difficulties with stress testing, we'll stop the stress test because you can't get any information uh, from the ECG. But if we, we might just hit the ECG at acquisition in early recovery when the heart rate is still high. And at that time, if there's absolutely no changes, like at 15 seconds into recovery, we can often get a good enough tracing to be able to say they have good exercise capacity and, and draw a conclusion about the stress test. And if the patient says, I, I, I want to stop the stress test, please stop the stress test. Um, like I said, ideally all stress testing should be symptom limited. Now, depending on protocols, location where it's performed, et cetera, we might not, you know, we might stop a patient once we have enough information. Um, but just using the 85 as a standard protocol, 85% of pre-predicted heart rate is not a good idea because it doesn't give us all the prognostic information, which is what most of us you know, sitting with a patient, you need to discuss with the patient. So when do you choose a pharmacologic stress test over an exercise stress test? Well, if they're not able to exercise, if they, you know, if they come in and they've got a leg brace, you ask them, you know, can you walk on a treadmill? Many of them will say yes, but can you walk on treadmills and that keep going up every three minutes and get faster every three minutes? A lot of them won't be able to. And if they walk with, um, if they have to walk with a limp, that would be difficult. So just that con when you're ordering the stress test, that conversation and just their assessment of how they move from the, uh, the chair to the examination table or how they walk into the uh, room, if you have the opportunity to see that, uh, determines what type of stress test they can do. If they've had a previous exercise stress test and they've had ST depressions and uh, along with that they've had um, you know, an imaging study which has been normal, they're not symptomatic. So if there's been a pre previous false positive or indeterminate exercise stress test, then you might want to choose a pharmacologic stress test or uh, simply add on an imaging study to the stress test. Finally, they have an uninterpretable baseline ECG. People with digoxin, they're on digoxin, it's going to linger on in their system while they're doing the stress test. They start to get all kinds of ST segment abnormalities. They should have an imaging study. People with pre-excitation, as Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, their ECGs can do unpredictable and funny things during a stress test. They cannot just have an exercise stress test. They probably should have a pharmacologic stress test if they're worried about ischemia, or an exercise stress test under supervision uh, with uh, kind of, um, you know electrophysiology being involved, et cetera, um, if they have Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. People with ventricular paced rhythm or left pharmacrine clock, they need a pharmacologic nuclear stress test with adenosine or uh, Lexuscan because they cannot, uh, if their heart rates go up with like with exercise over probutamine, you can get false um, abnormalities. You, you, you get ischemia being called, which is really not true ischemia, but it's due to uh, a phase lag of some sort. So um, basically, we should not be doing stress tests that increase your heart rate rapidly in patients with ventricular pace rhythms and left one flank squat because of that issue. So what, what are the alternatives that we can use? We can use adenosine, um, we can use persantine, and we can use regalimacin or Lexuscan. Let's talk a little bit about these vasodilators. So they work differently from exercise. In exercise, you increase your heart rate, you increase your blood pressure, the coronary demand goes up, you increase coronary blood flow in that way. And if there's flow heterogeneity and the supply demand mismatch, we start to see ischemia and be detected. 
In vasodilator stress testing, all you're doing is increasing coronary blood flow. You're not affecting the demand side of the equation generally. So areas with stenotic arteries are not able to increase their blood flow as much, and areas with um, normal arteries increase their blood flow a lot more. And so you get a flow difference between the two. You inject a tracer, you get a difference in the flow. You get flow heterogeneity, and you're able to pick it up differently in different areas. We don't tend to use uh, vasodilators and echocardiography. We tend to use it only with perfusion studies. Although in Europe, they, they do sometimes uh, use vasodilators. We, we just tend not to use echo and um, vasodilator stress testing. True ischemia is rare because all we're doing is opening up the artery. So if someone has true ischemia during vasodilator stress testing, and they get chest pain and SC segment changes, etc., uh, they probably have severe ischemia because they're probably getting steel and various types of phenomena. There, um, the adenosine is, is a plastic vasodilator. Um, it's a direct coronary arterial vasodilator. It activates. There are many different adenosine receptors. So the A2A receptor is the one that we want to target in order to cause this vasodilation, and it increases the flow three to four, fourfold. There are other adenosine receptors which cause other problems, like the A1 receptor causes AB block, which we utilize when we're trying to break someone out of SVT. Um, we, uh, A2B causes peripheral vasodilation, and uh, bronchospasm is caused by A2B and A3. So these are the side effects that we see during an adenosine stress test, and that's what we have to look out for. Percentine is very similar to adenosine in the sense that what it acts indirectly. It increases your adenosine co concentration, and it causes uh, your vasodilation in that way. So it's an indirect coronary vasodilation, and it lasts a little longer, too. People tend to be more symptomatic. Both adenosine and percentine need to be run as an infusion during the stress test um, in order to get your desired effect. But adenosine, as you know, wears off pretty rapidly after you stop the infusion. Both of these tend to cause um, quite a bit of symptoms of flushing, headache, as does regadenosin. But in my personal experience, and based on all the initial studies um, that were performed, the symptoms are generally less with Lexiscan. It's, it's just delivered as a bolus. You don't need to um, run an infusion or anything. Um, the half-life is complex, but basically it wears off in about five minutes. But some effects can linger on. So you know there are patients who have felt fine right after the test, but like 10 minutes later, they felt uh, funny, dizzy, flushed, etc. Um, so it's a complex half-life, um, like a triphasic half-life. But uh, the bottom line is this has become what we utilize here at St. Mary's, um, in Janesville. Uh, in, in most locations, especially hospital-based locations, this is what we use because it's very efficient for throughput of patients. And also, it works very well. It's been well validated and it's very convenient to use. Um, so, uh, and it basically is a more selective agent. So, uh, whereas uh, you can get flushing, chest pain, dizziness with all the agents, um, generally this is a little better tolerated. So, patients who said in the past that I'll never do a stress test again because they felt so miserable generally tend to tolerate this a little better. So, um, but all of these are symptoms that confuse us because during a stress test, you can get chest pain with vasodilator stress testing, and it's just the pharmacologic effect on the other receptors. Just like you get chest pain when you give that SVT, when you try to break that SVT with six or 12 milligrams of adenosine. AV block occurs in about 7.6% of the cases. Um, second degree AV block is 4%, complete heart block 1% of the cases. So patients with pre-existing heart block, we need to watch out when we're doing um, vasodilator stress testing. SD segment depression is common, but if you have significant SD segment depression and symptoms, those people generally are, are candidates to consider as a higher probability. Um, myocardial infarction can occur during vasodilator stress testing, depending on how severe their anatomy is. We do have an antidote, aminophilin, uh, reverses the effect, blocks the effect. So. Most often we need it with quercetin, but if someone's symptomatic, we can just utilize this, and you know that you know when they're leaving, their symptoms are controlled, they're feeling happy. So it is something we can utilize uh, aminophilin to reverse the side effects. So 
In preparing a patient for a vasodilator stress test, we need to make sure they're not on diaphragmal uh, containing medications. Um, like Agronox, which is still used for stroke a lot, um, should, not, uh, should be stopped um, at least 24 hours before the stress test. Caffeine, Theophylline, the all these agents um, interfere with the stress test, and you're not going to know if they're really being stressed if the receptors are blocked with these agents. So basically, it becomes a kind of dummy stress test if you have these agents floating around their system. So I generally, 12 hours is the, the party line, but I tell them just don't have any coffee or anything, any caffeinated products on the day before. Who should you not do a vasodilator stress for? If they have an acute coronary syndrome, you shouldn't do it. If they have a very low blood pressure, their blood pressure can drop further, you should watch out and not do a vasodilator stress test. If they're actively wheezing very short of breath, um, we shouldn't do a vasodilator stress test. If they have a mild wheeze and they're kind of that's their baseline, I still will often do a Lexi scan and you know just watch out and get have the inhalers ready or nebulizers ready. And people usually actually tolerate it pretty well. So I've had good experience with Lexiscan with even if they have mild wheezing. But with adenosine and presentine, if they have mild wheezing, I wouldn't do it. And we'd have to look for alternatives so do it at a later time. Uh, people with heart block and people with profound sinus bradycardia. When you stop a stress test, people's blood pressure can drop. You stop it then if they develop significant wheezing, they develop chest pain, poor perfusion, uh, or if the patient requests to stop it. The problem is uh, with some of these, like adenosine and percent patients will often say, stop the stress test, I can't take it anymore. We reassure them, we tell them these symptoms are going to go away, and we take them through it. Regadenosine is given as a bolus, so again, it's more convenient because it's done. And there's, you know, you just ride it out, and that's it. Dobutamine is less studied compared to dipyrdamol, and it's different. It's not a vasodilator. It's a beta agonist, as we know from heart failure, etc. Um, so it's it's you, it's beta one and beta two stimulation. It increases the heart rate, and it increases the blood pressure, and it increases myocardial contractility. So it kind of mimics exercise, and it does so better than um, percentine in the sense that it's more like exercise. But you can get all kinds of um, arrhythmias with, with dobutamine testing. Some people, their contractility gets so vigorous that their heart rate um, doesn't go up as much because of a reflex bradycardia. Um, so, and some people, they can actually get a little bit of hypotension with dobutamine if their contractility is too vigorous. So you, the, the response to dobutamine testing is a little more variable. Uh, the contraindications are basically similar to exercise test testing. So aortic aneurysms, the aortic stenosis, uh, VT, all that sort of thing. But in addition to that, beta blockers, they're on beta blockers, you can't do the immune stress testing. And there's or, or basically any AV blocking agents that are not going to get your heart rate up uh, because they're going to counteract the effects. But otherwise, the, the indications and contraindications and the indications for stopping are generally the same as for exercise stress testing. Let's talk a little bit about the use and interpretation of stress tests. And basically, I'll, I'll leave this up to questions at the end, but a stress test report should contain the type of stress test, the vital signs and symptoms during the stress test, what the baseline ECG looked like, what the changes in stress were, whether there were any arrhythmias, and what type of imaging was used, what the quality of that imaging was, so that you can draw a conclusion. Um, there are a lot of pitfalls we encounter. We spoke about exercise stress testing. In nuclear stress testing, you can get artifacts. So when you talk about breast attenuation or diaphragmatic attenuation, it's just that when you have tissue uh, and you have the tracer taken up by the heart, as the tracer is making its way out, uh, and a scanner, which is basically detecting light that's coming out of, uh, from the inside, um, it causes a shadowing effect. And it makes it look like there's a region of the heart that doesn't have that much tracer in it. And that's what we talk about attenuation. It leads to a, a, a suggestion that there's poor blood flow to that region, or that there's a previous scar in that region. Additionally, if a patient moves during their 20 minutes of having to lay flat on their back with their arms up, if they move a lot, it leads to blurring of the images and problems. That's what we call patient motion artifact. And the diaphragm, especially in males, kind of sits below the heart, and it can cause a shadowing effect. 
Um, so that's a problem. What, that's what we call diaphragmatic attenuation. Finally, you can get what we call gating artifacts. So if you have someone with AFib, the way uh, the um, machine finds out what your uh, ejection fraction is, is it looks at beat to beat. So if you have to have a good regular heartbeat for it to be able to average the information from multiple heartbeats and give you that ejection fraction. So if you have very variable heartbeats, you get what we call gating artifacts. It'll give you a number, but the number is unreliable. So people with AFib, people with a lot of PVCs, you may get an ejection fraction, but it may be completely unreliable. Something to keep in mind um, when uh, you look at that ejection fraction in the nuclear stress test. On the other hand, if you have a good regular heart rate and you, you um, look at the ejection fraction estimate, it's usually a very good estimate of the ejection fraction. Unless, again, they have a large scar, then you don't, because in um, nuclear stress testing, unlike MAGA, which looks at the blood pool inside, um, in, in SPECT testing, you're looking at the walls, so if there's a, a large scar, you again, you can get inaccurate uh, wall, uh, you get inaccurate estimates of your uh, detection fraction. Something to look out for when you're getting those stress test results. Um, and with stress echo, it, it depends on uh, the echocardiographist experience, cardiologist experience, so depending on the institution you get the study from, there can be variable amounts of reliability. Uh, of the stress testing results. So, very important concept for all our testing is uh, pretest probability. We need to know what the prior probability of the condition. We need to know what we're looking for in a stress test, and we need to know how likely it is that patient is to have a, uh, is to have a problem. So, you know, you can figure out whether they have angina, and you know the angina has three typical three features that determine what we call typical angina. So there's substernal chest pain or discomfort, and it's provoked by exertion or emotional stress, and it's relieved by rest or nitroglycerin. So those are three uh, features of typical angina. If you have two of these features, we call it atypical chest pain, and uh, one or less feature, we call it non-anginal chest pain. Now, in actual practice, anything that's not typical, we call it typical. So, but um, this is the theoretical definition of typical, atypical, and non-anginal chest pain. Um, earlier studies dating back to 1979, very elegant studies, looked at basically your gender and your age, and they were able to classify what the chances that you have um, coronary disease were, depending on the type of chest pain that you have. Now, of course, this chest pain, as we know, is male pattern chest pain, the classic anginal chest pain. Women have different manifestations of chest pain, and especially older women and older men have different manifestations of chest pain. And also, they often, as we grow older, we present with more congestive heart failure symptoms and other symptoms rather than chest pain. So it's important to remember that. But men over 40 with typical chest pain, high probability. And women, um, even if they're above 60, if they have typical chest pain, then they, oh, let me get to that. If they have typical chest pain, then it's high probability. But anyone below the age of 60, even if they have typical chest pain, by this old, these older studies, um, they don't have coronary disease, so they're coronary disease. They have intermediate probability. So you can put them, uh, you can subject them to stress testing. But we know that you know people present in different ways, so we need more than that when we go in. Uh, and when we're evaluating patients, uh, not just in the acute setting, but also in the office setting. So utilize scoring systems. I just utilize the framing end system. You just, everyone knows about the calculator. You go in, you put a few bits of information, and that gives you an assessment of global risk. So if someone has less than 10%, it's low global risk. In women and younger men, it's less than 6%. If it's 10 to 20 percent is intermediate risk, and greater than 20 percent is high global risk. So, for example, if someone has high global risk and you're concerned about um, possibility of ischemia, you can do an exercise stress test um, to, to detect ischemia. That's allowed. Let's talk a little bit about pretest probability and post-test probability. And this is applicable to just about any test that you might do. Say you have a person with low pretest probability. Um, you perform a stress test and the stress test is negative. Well, that's great. 
have a very low pre-test, but post-test probability after the stress test. But what happens if your stress test is abnormal and they have a low pre-test probability? Well, you started off at about 5%, but you went up to 30%. So even after a positive <laughs> test, your post-test probability is only 30% if the patient actually has the problem. This is the difficulty we have with all our testing that's not perfect. None of our testing is perfect. Whereas a patient has a high pretest probability, you perform a stress test and it's normal. Your post-test probability is 50%. You still cannot be sure that they don't have the problem. So this is important to understand that stress tests are not perfect and that you really have to have an idea of how likely it is that you have a problem before you go in. But the intermediate probability patients, they start off at about, oh, maybe they have it, maybe they don't. Negative stress test, well, goes down to about 10%. Positive stress test goes up to 90%. It really helps in decision making as to what to do next. But people at extremes, you really have to uh, consider what your plan is going to be after the stress test and what sort of information you're going to give them rather than you have a negative or positive stress test. So let's talk a little bit about uh, various types of imaging guides. Um, what you do in stable patients with coronary artery disease. And I'll go through this relatively quickly. Um, basically, if, if you uh, have an asymptomatic individual and they have low risk, then you really probably shouldn't get a stress test. You just discuss their risk with them, show them how their 10-year risk is low, and that they really don't need to get a stress test. But in high-risk individuals, you um, could consider getting a stress test. I'm going to skip through some of these slides. We spoke about um, who we should be getting stress tests on. But in people who are symptomatic, uh, let's talk about heart failure patients. So, should you get stress tests on these patients or not? Make sure you consider whether they can do a stress test before you subject them to stress testing. If they have diastolic heart failure, remember diastolic failure was one of those things on that ischemic cascade. So um, you just stress testing with exercise may not be adequate. Imaging may be necessary if they have definite heart failure symptoms. In high risk patients, um, you would consider cardiac cath. But in other patients, you might want to uh, only stick with stress testing. Whereas with systolic heart failure, we have a lower threshold for considering cardiac catheterization. PVCs, patients with isolated PVCs probably don't need a stress test. Uh, patients with frequent PVCs, you could consider stress testing. And patients with um, syncope provide, are another difficult category. I think syncope is really important to take a good syncope history and determine whether they need a stress test. And again, a global risk score is very useful in determining whether they need a stress test or not. And that, because that gives us your pretest probability. What about sequential testing? If someone's had a previous abnormal ECG stress test, then you want to do a stress test with imaging or cardiac cath rather than just a repeat exercise stress test. If they've had a previous abnormal stress imaging, then <coughs> consider cardiac cath or if you have cardiac CT available, that would be an option. If you just had an abnormal calcium score, then you consider stress testing in some of these patients if the score is abnormal, not just some calcium on your CT as an incidental finding when looking at um, for a PE or something. Um, in asymptomatic individuals who had prior revascularization, it's rarely appropriate to obtain a stress test in less than two years if they've had PCI, and it's rarely appropriate in bypass in less than five years. So if you're doing well, the old victim of let's get an annual stress test is really not appropriate. We, we can stretch it out further, look for symptoms. If patients are symptomatic, then address the symptoms. But if they're asymptomatic and doing well, you really don't need to stress the patient uh, after bypass, etc., until five year mark. I'm going to stop there so that I can take any questions from the audience. Yes, please. It's, it's, with all these variables, it strikes me that a mature cardiology practice, such as we have here at St. Mary's, should have almost an algorithm 
that that uh, assesses an incoming patient so that the appropriate test is selected. Is that is such a thing available? So it, it cannot be algorithmic because there are so many variables that go into it. Um, so it, you know, it, we, we try to fit patients into algorithms. We have a chest pain algorithm in the ED. We, have, we try to fit patients in algorithms at, at various levels. But the problem is you really need to have that global sense of what's going on in this patient. So we do have some sort of an algorithm in that, you know, I, I think pretty much all cardiologists that I work with would be in congruence with what I've discussed here today, and they would agree with me, and, and most practicing physicians too would. But as far as just setting up a set of li a list of a checklist of things that they go through and determine things, I think that's very hard to do because it has to be individualized. Um, precisely because pre-test probability, post-test probability, and clinical follow-up matters because we've all had that patient who that who's had a stress test and six months later has an MI or, or two months later requires a bypass and say, why did I have an, a normal stress test? You know, because none of these tests are perfect and we have to consider the global uh, score and we also have to consider how the clinical course is because if you start to develop a strong sense that this could be real, then we need to revisit this. And some of that we cannot capture in an algorithm. But in answer to your question, we do take some of this information and use that in decision making, even during a stress test, which is what we do when we you know, might get a call back or make recommendations a lot. Yeah. I think in the interest of time, if, if you wouldn't mind sticking around for a few minutes, if people want to meet you out in the hall for other questions, it would be my it's fine. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you.